Hello, everybody, yeah. and welcome to Back Tapes. Uh, this is going to be a series of uh, videos and resources on Quidditch theory and coaching basics uh, to get people new into the sport, uh, some more background information. Uh, I'm JT or James Sandergarden, your host, and I'm joined by. My name's Jay Holmes. Oh, smooth. My name's Jay Holmes. I'm the current Team UK head coach and have been the captain of Velociraptors Quidditch Club for two years before I stepped down from the role this year. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Morgan. I've uh, been playing for three or four years now. Um, I'm just here to sort of ask some of the questions that maybe um, these two don't think that people are going to ask, um, just from a kind of um, learner's point of view, um, to try and help. Uh, how many questions you might have get answered during this call. Cool. So each of these uh, videos and resources is going to focus around one aspect of Quidditch. Uh, today we're starting with uh, a defense system called Compact Defense. It's probably the most prevalent one uh, amongst teams in the UK at the moment and has been since it came to prominence here in 2015-2016 season. And so we're going to go through what it is, how it works, some of its strengths and weaknesses, Hopefully, give you a better idea of it. He says. So, before we go into that, to make sure we're all on the same page uh, and we're all talking about the same stuff, uh, we're going to go through some of these key terms. Uh, people say these words a lot, and quite often they mean slightly different things. So, to make sure we alleviate that, uh, we're going to go through them. So, the first one we've got is zone. Uh, a zone defense is one where every player on pitch is assigned a part of the pitch uh, to be responsible for. Um, so you might have a top of the pitch, left or right, wherever, but each person is in a space. Um, that's kind of the opposite of uh, man coverage, man-to-man -man or one-to-one, -one, where each player is assigned an opposite member um, to mark, to cover, to be responsible for. So those are your kind of two extremes with hybrid being a mix of the two. Uh, Jay, would you like to elaborate any more on that? Yeah, I think the, the main thing to remember when we're using the term zone is that you have to be disciplined with it. You, you have to have it in your, your mind that you're defending a part of the pitch. You're not ball watching or defending the ball or defending a specific individual. Um, you're, you're defending a section of the pitch and it's about your own patience, your own intelligence to, to realise who's in that zone and who you should be marking and what you should be marking. I think man-to-man -man coverage is, is one of the, the harder defences uh, to play well um, and re relies a lot on intelligence and athleticism. And hybrid is a good in-between, especially for a lot of starter teams. Uh, a zone defence is probably the, the easier one to play for, for new players because uh, it requires less nuance as you're starting out. But then if you have some more experienced players or athletic players, you can look at this uh, man coverage defence. It's, it's very similar to what you may play in other sports. So when you've got a new team, it's all about gauging their, their sporting experience and their sporting knowledge so you know which defence they might be better at. Thank you. Uh, the last three points on the screen are some uh, phrases that we're going to use throughout the course of this, just so you know what we mean. So for help defence, we mean any time where you can rely on another member of your team to come and help you make a stop or a block. So literally means to help in defense, um, as opposed to just leaving them to themselves. Uh, for point, when we are using the word point, we mean the player closest to the opposite team with the ball. So that's normally the front and middle player in a zone, but it could be anyone who is close to the ball. They are now the point, the front of the defense. And then lane is the final term we're going to go through just quickly. For that, we're referring to any route to goal. Uh, the common ones you'll hear are a shooting lane or a driving lane or a passing lane. We mean the route to the goal, to the hoops. Okay. Uh, anything anyone would like to add on to any of those? Yeah, yeah just um, go on. Go on. Uh, yeah, so my, um, just, just really about um, the zones, how, how exactly are the zones sort of assigned, how is it split up, and how do you sort of name them to sort of communicate that? So that's something that we're going to cover in our compact defence 
look today. But most of the time when you have a zone defence in Quidditch, you've got your, your frontward zone, your left zone, your right zone and your backward zone. Those are the, the simplest zones <laughs> to look at. Um, you don't always need to name the zones. Everyone should know forward, backwards, left and right, I would hope. Um, but it's mainly down to the communication of your team. A good zone defence relies on communication, which is something we're going to look at going forward. So I'd say people don't need to worry about coming up for, for terms for different zones. It's just about knowing the threats that occupy certain spaces and just where those spaces are on the pitch because attacking or being attacked from the left or right of the hoops is very different to being attacked from the front or behind of the hoops. And that's something that we're going to try and cover today. Cool. Great. So those are our terms that we're going to refer back to. Okay, so, uh, shockingly, uh, we are all teachers. So this is kind of our LA for today. Uh, so we're going to cover our uh, compact defence, our compact zone. It's a certain type of zone. Uh, so we're going to go through what it is, uh, its strengths and its weaknesses, and how we would drill it, and when a team might decide that's what they want to be playing. Okay. So what it is. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, combat defense is a zone defense. So as I said earlier, a zone, each player is responsible for one part of the pitch. What makes this slightly different to other compact zones is you are setting that much closer to your own hoops and much narrower uh, in terms of the width of the pitch. So that you're really making your zone as close to a square around the hoops as you can. Um, so it sets about halfway back from the halfway line into the keeper zone. That's where your sort of point of defender, your start of your zone will be. Uh, the idea being that everybody is there to help each other. They can um, cover the different players, cover the space where the goal is more likely to be scored. Okay. Uh, anyone like to elaborate on that slightly more? Jay, Dan? Uh, yeah, so we're going to get into the strengths and, strengths and weaknesses in a second. Um, but what I always call this is this is a very forward-facing defence. So this is, as an attacking player, as they come into your half, they're basically confronted with your entire team. Okay, so as I walk in as my team's keeper with the quaffle, I see every member of the team in front of me. So immediately, I can see the entire a uh, team is ready to make a stop, and this has a big psychological edge, especially with new teams. It's a lot harder to break through an entire team than it is one or two players. And this is what Compact's built for. It's, it's showing the offence, the entire team, and then asking them, forcing them to make a decision from there. Okay, It's a defence that relies on basically you being disciplined and, and sticking to your spaces and then forcing the offence to adjust. OK, that's what we're looking to do with, with this defence is, is force the offence to react and hopefully they'll make a mistake and we can get the ball. Cool. All right. So this is kind of what it looks like on pitch with the red uh, crosses being uh, quarter players and the red stars being the beaters. So as you can see, it's very narrow, just outside the width of the hoops uh, with a person step back onto the hoops normally the keeper but doesn't have to be and then a point defender um, set about halfway between the halfway line and the keeper zone and is who is ready to uh, drop back as pressure unfolds um, around the outside we've got the blue um, cha opposition chasers who are on offense in a standard offensive position so as you can see the person with the ball has got most of the team to go through. Okay. That's our I, think so. I think something that's really important to, to think about is when we think of a zone defence, that doesn't just mean uh, standing there still and hoping for the best. A lot of times when we think of a zone, we think of it as a very lazy way to defend um, and sort of relying on the opposition to make a mistake. But when you've got your new team, it's, it's really good practice to prioritise, you know, staying on the balls of your feet, being in an athletic stance, being active. Um, and if, if they can, playing what we call hands-up defence, which simply means when there's a player with the ball in front of me, I've just got my hands up to try and obscure their view or uh, block a shot or block a pass. Just because you're sticking to your zone doesn't mean you're standing still. You've still got to react. You've still got to move. And it's really important that your players do this too. Because 
the easiest thing to attack is somebody standing still. It's hard to be explosive or reactive when we're standing still. So you need to make sure, even though we're being really disciplined in our zone, that we are still ready to move and keeping an eye out for, for what's going on. Um, yeah, just uh, just have a quick question on that one. Um, obviously, you're showing up there as having two two beaters mm -hmm. in the defence. Um, if you only had one, would that change where they are, or basically how how the setup's working, or or not that much? Honestly, not especially. So you want your beaters behind your point defender in the zone, closer to the hoops, so that any offensive beater has to come further forward to engage. Um, Essentially, beaters are more powerful the closer they are to their own hoops because mm. it's easier to tap back in if they're beat out. Um, it's a much shorter distance to run if they're beat out, and conversely, much further for the offensive beaters if they exchange. So if you lose a beater to a card or just one's not armed, you would just set your armed beater slightly further back, and then if they've got a partner, they can be screened by them. But in general, it's around that spacing still, um, potentially dropping back slightly further if you're under a lot of pressure. Okay, but yeah, in the middle of the zone is the important thing. Um, it just makes everybody's job a lot harder. But on offense, if they're there, that's where the goal is. For the hoops are. And um, for the two sort of red X's that are obviously out to the side, they're not um, wanting to be drawn out to uh, to the blue X's that are obviously the offensive players. That favorite, they just want to hold their position. Yeah, they want to hold their position in front. So, uh, this particular <laughs> picture is assuming the ball is in the uh, hands of the um blue chaser in the middle of the screen. So, yeah. they want you want your red defense to be all in the way of the hoops for them. Um, we okay. essentially don't care if the person on the wing is there because they don't have the ball and they're not an immediate danger to score because they're so far away and the angle is so rough. If the ball gets moved to them, then your cross, your plus sign, ha already has somebody facing them. doesn't matter if the ball moves to here, because this person's already covered, um, as a general. So the, the angle might change slightly, but the formation is still the same. Okay? I think something else that's really uh, important to, to look at when we look at this defence, obviously we've got our four red uh, crosses. And it can be really easy for those three nearest the hoops to just become a line. So you basically have a 3-1 defence or something that's called Baylor, which I think we're going to look at in a, another episode. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that this is a 1-2-1 one, one defence. So you need that one player guarding the hoops. But then those two players that are stepping up need to be either on the keeper zone or just a step or so back. They still need that bit of space and separation between them. The distance you're looking for is their shoulder uh, should basic their shoulder closest the hoop should be in line with the hoops. What we're doing here is if our blue uh, cross with the quaffle decides uh, that they want to shoot, is that our our two in our one two one can block the shot or block the pass, and that's really important that those two at the side don't drift out too much or else you leave lots of gaps in the defence that can break down. So you need to be about either on the keeper zone or a step in or out of it, and making sure that you're, you can still cover the hoops with your hand that's closest to the hoops. Cool. Now, with the magic of technology, we're going to try and see this in action. So we have here a video from QPL in 20... I'm going to say 17, um, where Rose is the team in white shows an example of um, a defense. So we have uh, number 29, Josh Armitage, on point at the moment, who is just sinking back into his zone, dropping back away from half line, halfway line. Uh, we have our two beaters in the middle, and then you'll see the other players in a sec. So back we go. So we've got our three chasers in shot, and the right-hand chaser is just off-screen. You'll see them in a sec. Basic setup. There we go. So your chasers are dropped near to their own hoops. I'd suggest they may be a little wider in the shot uh, in terms of left and right, but you've got them all within a relatively small space. The beaters have exchanged. There's nowhere really for AJ to go, which isn't through another player. 
and we should hopefully see a good stop in a sec. So once their feed has come out and the immediate happen, the turnover happens and off they run. Okay. So we saw our cross formation, our plus sign, left, right, top and bottom, beast in the middle, and when the beast is exchanged, they actually manage to make a breakout and get the turnover. Essentially, a perfect stop, and they get to go off on their own. Okay. One thing I would have said would have said is maybe having the left and right chasers in a little bit more so that they're actually covering the shot, especially knowing who's on pitch at the time. The hoops were a little open than we would like to see ideally, but gives you the gist. All good? Yeah, um, I was just sorry, I was just going to ask, um, obviously when you put the circles up, about the distance of the keeper from the hoops as well, yeah, this one. Um, I mean, he looks quite close. Um, is, is that the right sort of distance? Should he be a bit further out? Uh, uh, go for it, Jay. Uh, I think it depends on uh, who your hoop defender is. I think, uh, for, especially for newer teams, uh, you have to get out of the idea that the person with the green headband always blocks the hoops. Um, and everyone should be able to block the hoops with a degree of uh, competency. It also depends on how reactive your keeper is. For me here, I'd like the keeper basically as that tackle's being made, just to take a little bit of a step up, uh, just in case that they need to cover a near shot or a pass. But the issue is if you overcommit, and that pass or that shot comes, you're leaving yourself exposed. It can be really easy as the hoop defender to think that you've got basically a free pass to not play defence. Uh, because you can say, well, if the quaffle's got for everyone else, what, what hope did I have? And also, if you make a stop, the chances of you being involved in it are quite small. But as a keeper, you do need to be ready to play that help defence, to step up when required, or to look to see what shots or passes are being covered, okay? And another thing, and I can't stress this enough, is the person at the hoops is where the communication is coming from. In this defence, they are really, really important in knowing where the ball is and telling their team where the ball is, okay? A good communicator on your team will save a defence, okay? So your person at the hoops is going to be saying, the ball's gone right, we need to shift right. The ball's gone left, we need to shift left. The point, so that's the person closest to the ball, has been beaten out, someone needs to replace them. Okay, that person is your pivot for the defence. They need to be orchestrating where everyone is. James, do you have a point to follow up? Yeah, so I think on, so I completely agree. In terms of positioning, where I would like the players to be, uh, especially in this setup, is I think Josh is in a good position, he's at the right height away from the hoops. They've engaged at the right moment. I would like Mike, the keeper, to be maybe one big step further forwards. Um, mm -hmm. All of the players are in front of him, so there's no present threat of a looping pass over the top. Um, so he could easily be on the cone in front. And then the two left and right chasers, I'd like to be one cone further towards the middle to help out. At the moment, the right chaser is a little wide to be able to help make a stop. Um, so yeah, just tucking in a bit more, just to give himself a bit more help and make it a little bit harder for AJ, the offensive player, to make the stop. I think, I think it's something we're going to talk about with the strengths and weaknesses, but if um, the, the chap with the ball mm -hmm. comes running forward, and, uh, the chaser out on that far side also runs towards the hoops. Can obviously get in front of the, the right-sided defender. Mm. It kind of looks like there's a lot of people running at just that one keeper then. Um, yeah. yeah, so... Probably, probably going to come up in, in a bit, right? Yeah, yeah I think um, just before we go on to that, that's what James is saying about them being too uh, wide. If yeah. both the, the wider chasers took two or three big steps on the inside, that that wouldn't be a threat because that would allow that chaser to help them on the defence. And if the pass of the shot is coming, it allows the, the hoop defender, the keeper, uh, to react to that. Okay. It's a good rule of thumb is in this sort of defence, if a player is shooting, we should be able to make a stop or at least get our hands to it. Um, 
the chances of if those two players had tucked in those two, three big steps, the chances of a shot going in from forward facing of the hoops are very, very small. Yeah, yeah I want them about here where I am on screen um, to help make that. Oh, but Josh does a very good job of pushing the chaser out to the wing. Let's see. So we'll come on to the strength in a sec. Yeah. Push, push away, push away, and it slows down enough to make that stop. Okay. So we're talking about this defense. What are some of its strengths? Um, these are the kind of ones we've come up with as a uh, team, why you might want to do um, a combat defense. And it has historically been very successful, especially in this country, um, for a number of years. So the main strength of this defense is, is that it's collective. The players are close together and it makes driving much less desirable as an option. Right? I think we can all agree running with the ball is easier than throwing the ball. And this deters people from wanting to run with it. Like If you have the ball in your hand and you look up and you see three people, four people stood in front of you and the goal, that's not something <coughs> any, any driver wants to see. And so it's that psychological edge you're giving to your team. You're going, try and run through as I bet you can't. And if you pull this off, you know, you win that bet. Uh, the other big strength of this is the players naturally are closer to their own hoops. And that means the recovery time, if they're beat out, both as a chaser and a beater, is massively reduced. If I'm only having to go three, four steps to the hoop to tap back in, I'm immediately back in the play as opposed to having been out on the touchline, man-marking someone, having to run a quarter of the length of the pitch to get back into the play. Um, as I say, same with beaters. If the beaters exchange, my beater on defense can just immediately tap back in and they're back in defense. The opposition beater has to go all the way back to their own hoops, you know, three quarters the length of the pitch to get back into the play. Now, obviously, that's not that far, really. But if you're having to do that, every play that three to one ratio of running is massively in my favor which means when it gets to snitch on pitch when it gets to crunch time end of the game my first line beaters are going to be fresher than yours because they've had to do less running i said there's more people in the way the lane the driving lanes the shooting lanes are way more covered in this defense meaning you have to try and create it with a pass a skill set that is harder to come by it also encourages and I can't stress this enough, are over committing. If my players are all really deep, that means you as an offense are naturally going to go further up the field and you're more inclined, more likely, to push more players up. So that if I do make a stop, if I do manage to make a turnover, your players are more out of position because they're so much closer to my hoops, which means the fast break is on, the counter push is on more often than it would be if we'd engaged higher up the field. Uh, and finally, as I said earlier, it just requires a lot less stamina. Um, while you still want to be active, still want to be moving, still pushing, being physical, I am having to do less running. And that lets your first line stay on for that much longer. Um, and if our first lines are equal in terms of ability and power level, and mine are fresher, mine should win. Um, anyone else want to say anything about the strengths of this defense? Yeah, so this is a defense which is uh, primarily designed to stop what I call two-meter players. So when I say two-meter player, what I mean is the sort of player that if you give them the ball two meters from the hooks and there's no bludgers stopping them, uh, there's a really good chance that, that they're going to stop. Okay? This is really common at Merc tournaments. It's especially how I like to play at a Merc tournament <laughs> as well. I like to be very, very physical on offense because I know that makes it much harder for a defense and it helps me to challenge someone's competence, which is a point I'm going to get onto. So two meters from the keepers, uh, from the hoops, if I get the ball, my aim is to either try and go through your defender or just carve around. Them. This defense makes that so much harder for me to do for a number of reasons. A, as James has said, I'm looking at the whole defense. Okay, driving physically is a really powerful tool for your team to have, and I really enjoy it, but it's also very sapping of an, someone's energy supply. Me catching the ball and shooting to score requires so much less energy 
than if I've got to take two players with me to the hoops. So I know that I'm going to in for a more energy sapping time. Secondly, the help defense here is vital in stopping a driver. So even if I drive on your point defender and I give them the old forearm shiver and knock them down, your second player, the one that I'm closest to, can then leave their zone because I've crossed into it and come and try and either take the ball off me or make another tackle. And eventually, if it doesn't look like I'm going to pass, you can end up with two quaffle players, two, two, of the, two at the top, and the person guarding hoops all trying to stop me. Okay, And that's really, really energy sapping. Okay? Even if I still score, I'm going to be a lot more tired than if I just had to beat one player and go in. Okay? And at Merc tournaments, that's how people are going to try and score. Going on from this, confidence is really key for this uh, defence to be a strength. If I'm my Merc tournaments keeper and I take the drive and you stop me, I'm less likely to drive the second time. If you stop me a second time, then I'm going to have to try and do something different with my offense. When we talk about confidence, that isn't making an amazing tackle and taking someone down. It's just about being in the way. It's just about being a body in the way. Especially new players don't like driving straight over other people because they don't see it as a viable way. And there's a, a big chance you're going to be stopped. Okay, It takes a lot of confidence to think that you have the, the tool set to basically drive over someone, recover and still score, which is why we see so many new players, especially when you get, you know, the big rugby lad who thinks he's fantastic, tucks the ball, tries to drive and then fumbles it or coughs it up or, or gets it slapped out of their hands. That's what this defence is stopping. It's stopping the overconfident driver and forcing them to try and do something else with the offence, which is much, much harder than just running in straight lines. Yeah, um, almost exactly. It's what we would call a meta choice um, in terms of if you think the opposition is going to be a bit direct running Quidditch, this is a really good option. And it plays into that a lot. If you've got confident tacklers who are physical, can be dominating in that position, this is the defense view. This is a really good way of forcing that issue. Okay. However, I suppose it also. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, you're saying that obviously um, they're obviously driving at you. It's really hard for them because they're obviously driving through two or three players, sapping their energy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one of the other strengths ties straight into it. They've scored. You just pick it up and you throw the ball, you do your fast break and score. Mm -hmm. And you're still balanced, except they're a bit more tired. So that goes on for four, four goals, for example. Yeah. You're then... Still feeling all right, as you said. Your your first your first line still, you know, not that tired, but they're obviously pretty exhausted and moving on to their next line. So it's it's almost like a, like that sort of longer game, that that sort of forward planning. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, I, just, I, I, sorry, um, an example cool. that I have of this being worked. Um, why a team would use this in particular uh, mm -hmm. is Nottingham in the um, twenty. I want to say twenty sixteen. BQC, um, our first line and our first two lines were very good and very physical. And so any system of defense that allowed us to leverage that, that we had multiple people who could tackle and multiple people who could run a fast break, meant it's what we wanted to use. Um, and the bonus of it, meaning we got to be fresher for longer, meant we got to leverage the fact we had such a good first line um, for longer at all, and it does just play out over, over a game. A close game becomes not close because I'm just able to run it for longer than you are, and that's a massive advantage that isn't, I don't think, used enough um, due to rotations. Sorry, Jay. I think uh, something to bear in mind, especially for new teams, is that the, no defense is going to work every time. You're always going to concede. Uh, and especially if that other team's got a real like talisman star player, that can be really, really demoralising if you're conceding to the same person over and over again. Uh, so the way to look at it is you have to basically see there's, there's players you can stop, which means I, I can stop them scoring, and I'm confident I can make a good effort every time to prevent them from scoring. 
But there's then going to be players that you can only contain. And that's the way to look at this. This defence contains that excellent driver. Yes, they still might score three or four goals on you. But in the grand scheme of a game, three or four goals can be clawed back. Now, if we're playing that one-to-one defence, that driver is going to absolutely carve you up for eight, nine, ten goals. I've seen it happen plenty of times. So you have to look. If I can't stop a player, what's the best thing I can do to contain them, to give them as the hardest choice, the hardest opportunities, the, the lowest possible chances? And this defence is about containing those super confident drivers. Except you're not always going to stop them, but except what you are doing is going a good way to keeping you in the game. Yeah, I think that wraps up very nicely. Uh, so we've said this is all the strengths of it. Um, so why doesn't every team do it? Why doesn't why isn't this the dominating tactic in world Quidditch? Well, unfortunately, it does have some some glaring Man. glaring weaknesses. <laughs> uh, the big one being because you're having to mark the zone for the hoop to avoid people shooting, you're always playing, even at the best of times, four on three. There are going to be four offensive players, quaffle players, versus your three position on defense. Meaning someone is always free for a pass. There is always a passing option covered. So if full speed on the other team, they're able to pass the ball really fast and accurately and, you know, catch it. It can lead to you pulling apart this defense. If I can push the ball left, round, round the back and keep moving it, I can get it to a free player. I can create an opportunity where the zone starts to break down either through miscommunication or lack of patience or just physically moving it faster than you can react to reform your zone. Um, and that is easier when there's someone always free. Uh, it does rely on that communication of what to do, where to position people. Uh, and that is a skill set that is hard, especially if you're new, you don't necessarily know. And so people who can talk, people who can think is a commodity that we don't, I think, have appreciated enough, um, especially in UK Quidditch. Um, people who can talk are rarer than you would think despite how much people like to talk. Um, and so if you have someone who can't communicate it, if you're a bit confused, you can get, again, pulled apart. Um, the other weakness of this is if your team has an athletic advantage, they are stronger, faster, more agile, you're actually giving that up by making them stay in their zone. If each of your players is more athletic than the, team, than the opposition, you're losing that by making them stand in this five meter circle as opposed to going out and trying to dominate all over the pitch. Um, it's also mentally taxing, right? So you might not be running lots, you might not be physically tired, but the idea of staying in your zone, staying switched on when yours isn't the zone being attacked is hard. And that leads to people breaking out of their zone, getting confused, going the wrong way, not reading the play enough because they're not quite switched on enough. And that means it gets broken down. And as soon as it breaks down, it's a free-for-all, which obviously benefits the offense. Um, yeah, I think that's the big one. It's mentally tiring, if not physically tiring, which leads to mistakes happening, wrong calls being made. And then the system, which is meant to be quite structured, falls down to individuals, and that's not where you want to be if this is what you've been drilling. Jay? Yeah, I think as well, um, from an offensive point of view, in every defence you're playing, you're always looking for a weak point. Um, a good example is if I've got a pane of glass and there's a crack in it, to break the pane of glass, I'm, I'm going to hit the crack because that's the easiest thing for me to do. Uh, and this defence works the, the same way. If you've got a player who's clearly shown that they aren't going to commit to contact. And by this, I don't mean a tackle, but even a push, a hands-on, a nudge. That leaves a hole in your defence. If I know I can go to the left side of the pitch and your player isn't going to make an attempt to touch me, that basically means they're not there. And we're going to get over how to drill this. But you need to, especially as a new team, uh, be practising 
contact, being contacted, and just breaking that barrier um, fairly early on for this defence to work. Um, because being honest, if your players won't attempt any sort of stop, I'm just going to step around them. And I'm not a very agile man. Okay, I rely on being heavier and nastier than most of the people that I'm playing. Um, and that's what this defence is trying to stop. But if it then becomes that you're, you're not even putting a hand out, that really slows your defence down. This defence is built on trust and it's built on confidence. You've got to trust that people are going to try and make a stop and you've got to have confident players that they will make a stop. It's really, really horrible. I know when you've got you know a, a 95 kilo man running towards you but you've got to have the confidence to even just try and shove them or push them or, or swipe for the ball and that's the sort of confidence you need to be creating in training through drills and also supporting your players and picking them up everyone misses tackles that's just part of the game that's part of life um, they know they've missed that tackle shouting at them for it isn't going to help it's about it's like picking them up it, it, it does help but you know <laughs> we're trying to inspire these young new players um, and it's just about making sure they know what they can do the next time. Yeah, I, mean, I think... Um, go down. Go just, just got a bit of a question there, because obviously we're saying, you know, you've got to trust and, and almost sort of stay in your zone when something's happening in the other zone. Mm. But we've also spoke, spoken about the help, and obviously, mm -hmm. uh, especially in that video, that obviously there was an option to help. Um, how, how are you making the decisions as to, you know, whether you go or stay or... So, uh, and, and think, so that's part of drilling. So that's a good question. Like, so you are nominally in your zone, okay? Um, but you need to know the other people you have on pitch. If you um, have someone driving over one of your defenders, you don't leave, and to use Jay's window analogy, glass analogy, you don't leave the crack alone. You try and fix it. So if you know that that part of your zone is weak you have to adjust your zones slightly to cover so you give that person um some additional help so you might actually get slightly closer so if you imagine i'm in a five meter circle that's my zone rather than me standing in the middle of that and having you know my space around me i might start standing slightly more inwards closer to this person in order to let me let me help if I need to, um, and that's fine, provided I've communicated with everybody else that that's what I'm doing, so that they know there's some space behind me that I've left. Yeah, so I'm not going to go stand and hold their hands. Your, your yeah. position, because you wouldn't be doing your job as exactly. fully. Exactly. Right. So I, I go closer. I communicate that I've left space. I don't go and hold their hand. I don't go stand right next to them, but I edge. I edge that way slightly in case it's needed. Jay, sorry. I think something else to bear in mind is, uh, so there's a phrase called riding a tackle, which basically means uh, when someone tackles you that they don't take you to the ground or stop you, but they hold on and they continue moving. The closer I as an offensive player get to the hoops, the bigger chance I have of scoring. Now, I will happily ride a tackle all the way to the hoops if I need to, to try and score. What the help defence means is the closer I'm getting to the hoops, the higher percentage I'm having of scoring. And you need to basically make the decision, is there a better percentage of us stopping if I stay in my zone, or if I leave my zone and go and play the help? Now, the longer I've ridden the tackle, the closer I'm getting the hoops, my percentages of scoring go up, which means you need to make the decision to leave the zone. If I'm in a zone defence with James and... Jack the fresher is running through and James nails him that first time with a tackle like I hope he would because I trust him as my teammate. I know that the next time James is going to be fine. But then we go to the next possession. It's, it's me on point and James is looking. James knows I'm not the most confident tackler. Suddenly we've got Max the fresher who's a 110 kilo Tongan man who's decided he's going to play Quidditch for a laugh. I know that I'm not stopping Max. James knows I'm not stopping Max. My mum, who's sitting at home watching the live stream, definitely knows I'm not stopping Max. So that <laughs> indicator that he needs to play the help defence. Yes, I'm going to try and make that initial push, but James has read the situation and sees that I might need some help 
stopping Max, the 110 kilo Tonga. Mm. Like, so another is, way, sorry, yeah. sorry, so, so another weakness of this would be uh, just switching where different people are as well. I, I would, I would assume then, uh, obviously in the offense, if you started off with having your two biggest players in the center, if you switch them then to out on the wing, would the defense, uh, with this defense, would you change who's where? Or would you just obviously apply some help? If you have time, so if it's a slow offense and you have time to shift your defense around, then yeah, you would look for your matchups as you would anywhere else. Um, if it's a fast break situation or it's happening in the moment, you can't afford to go and work out the exact matchups. You go, oh, I've got 70-30, you've got a 60-40, let's swap. Like, if you've got time, you do it. If you don't, you have to move. Um, one thing I would suggest that this has over other zones, because there are variations of zones, is because we start closer together, um, it's easier for me to help without giving up my spacing. So if I actually split my half of the pitch into four quarters, that would be quite hard for me to cover everything. But because I'm only actually caring about, let's say, the three, maximum five metres around the front of the hoops, I can shift across to help you without giving up too much space because I really don't care if the player who is on the touchline is on the touchline. I'm not giving up anything there to come and help you. If they make that pass to that person on the touchline, fine, I'll shift across. I've got time to shift. Yeah? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah and this, is what, yeah. this is what we're saying about your, your keeper reading the situation and being a versatile player. Your keeper probably going to be one of the easiest people to swap with. And we're getting into it a bit. You've got different types of keepers. So you've got mainly offensive keepers whose defence might not be as good. You've got some uh, shot blocking keepers. You've got some tackling keepers. It doesn't really matter. Um, but what this means is your keeper is going to be the person who has to read the situation. And they can help basically any of the three points in the defence. So it's up to, to them to see that they might have to give up their position to go and make a tackle and then someone else can fill in. So this is why your, your hoops defender really needs to be awake because they can feasibly help out anyone on the defence. Yeah. Cool. Great. So uh, this one's the how and went on it. So we've sort of talked, spoken about it. Uh, I would choose to use this if I have an athletic disadvantage against my opposition in terms of speed. So my players aren't the fastest, but we are quite confident in tackling. If you have to disadvantage over ev everywhere, then you can't affect that. That's unfortunate. You will have something that you are stronger at. You will either be stronger at tackling or stronger at marking. Wherever you fall on the scale of not great to fantastic, doesn't matter. You will have a strength relative to your team. So that's where I would pick it. If I'm slightly slower, but I am stronger and I'm good at tackling. Uh, in terms of how I would go about drilling this, this is an example I've got on screen. And it would start with the basic principle of we are stronger together. The idea being, if we are together, if we are bunched up, it is making the life of the offense much harder. All of our players are stronger by being closer to their own hoops, by being closer to someone who can help. Beasts are closer because they don't have to tap in as far. Chasers are stronger because there is someone available to help close by. Um, the way I've drilled this in the past is I pair up my uh, point defender, my top player, and my hoop player, and I imagine they're tied by a cord, and then do the same thing with my left and my right chaser, and so that the distance between them doesn't massively change. If the ball goes left, my defense can shift that side, but the distance stays the same. I'm still keeping my compact square my diamond whatever you want to call it my cross the same distance but i'm just moving it around the pitch um prioritizing where the ball is attacking me from um so you get them in the right position you start moving around get used to them moving left right up down and then i can start having my offense in my drill start moving the ball around and getting the players to get used to it in real time getting used to going where do i go if the ball goes here or here and then I can start adding in more complex things like beaters coming into it, taking out a player. Where do I go and cover them? Who's calling what position? 
where do I need to go if I'm beat out, etc. Uh, what is really important with this is that every player knows every role. So you need to know what your job is, where you go for each of the four parts of the zone. Because there will be times you find yourself in any of the four points. And if you don't know what you're doing, because you've not drilled it, you've not practiced being in that position before, a good offense is going to know that. They're going to notice it. They're going to exploit it. And this will fall apart. So you need to have everybody playing every position so that they are used to knowing where to go in a given instance. Um, and I think that is something that newer teams struggle with more because you get people going, I'm the point defender. I'm the hoop defender. This, that's my job. I'm good at that bit. And that means if they find themselves on the wing, they end up encroaching into somebody else's space because they want to make the tackle. And that creates more space somewhere else for someone. Um, so getting people used to playing in each position is really helpful. You don't need to change headbands, but you do need them to stand in different places on the pitch and get used to it. I think with a new team, I'd, I'd probably put what you said there, Dan, as like a really positive strength, just because um, I think we've all played with people that always only ever done one specific bit. Um, even then, if you moved on to some of the other defences we'll talk about, they're a bit almost unsure about the rest of the pitch and what even mm. goes on or what happens there. Um, so, obviously, I mean, this was the first sort of defence that I learned, possibly not exactly like this. Um, but, but obviously then finding all those roles is finding how, how all of the pitch works and, and what it's like there. I know that sounds like maybe a strange yeah, yeah. concept. No, I, I think that's it. Like, so, in an ideal world... Every chaser, every quaffle player rather, uh, knows by heart, learns by rote, each of the four roles on pitch and the basics of where they should go in a given situation. So if left defender is beat out, where does everybody go? If right defender is beat out, top or bottom defender is beat out, whatever. Or you're a player down or whatever, whatever the situation is. If everybody learns those relatively simple heuristics, then yeah. in a it's game... Like eight numbers. Yeah, basically. It's a very easy flowchart. If you learn that by rote, then in a game, you know whoever you're on pitch with, I can do my job because I know you know your job. Mm. Where mentally taxing things come in is if I know that you don't know your job and then I'm having to hedge. So I know that you're lost over there, Dan, because you haven't done this drill before. You've not come to training, whatever. Yeah. I know I'm yeah. going to have to hedge your side a bit more, which means my mental focus is split on from my job, which means I'm going to do my job worse. Um, and then from a personal view, if I then screw up, then I'm going to be more mad at myself and you. But like, it, yeah, it's not hard to learn your role and someone else's role. It gives you a better idea and you will end up finding it there. Um, and I want to be able to mm -hmm. focus on my job because I know I should be able to trust everybody else. Uh, yeah, I think... Well, the communication here is really key. And I know that's a, something you'll hear in every sport from the age of about four onwards, is that communication's key. We've got to keep talking. We've got to keep talking. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Uh, and the reason it's repeated from when you're four till you're 40 uh, is because we always become lax at it. We always slow down. As a new player, it be really, really difficult to shout at your teammates and, and command your teammates. I know when I first joined Raptors, I found it really, really difficult to communicate with some of my teammates on pitch uh, because I, I was a bit intimidated by them uh, and I wasn't sure if I was right. I was really worried that if I made the wrong choice defensively, offensively, that somehow I was going to be ostracised from the club and I'd be shamed. And I, I was initially and then I became there was a meeting. to stop that. That was really, really useful. Um, but I think the, the things you need to think about on defence, the things you need to communicate is who's got the ball and where are they? This is the first thing everyone should be calling out. Who's got the ball and where is it? Second thing needs to be who's marking that player with the ball. Okay, Whose job is it to mark that player? And then after that, you can fill in the rest. Are there any particularly dangerous players? Is anyone making a specific cut? Is anyone wide open? But the things you need to nail down first Who's got the ball? Where is it? And who's doing something to mark them or try and stop them? Because if I'm 
marking my player. I'm concentrated on my zone, but the ball's gone to the other side of the pitch and I've not realised. Yes, part of that is my fault because I've not been heads up enough to notice. But part of that is definitely on my teammates for not telling me. You've got to be loud. You've got to be clear. It's really, really simple. If everyone's communicating, that's great. And then you can cut the fluff out as the season goes. Everyone will understand what's important from there. It's best to over-communicate to start off, especially in training when it actually doesn't matter. And then cut it down. Maybe you don't need to tell each other everything. You just need to make each other aware of the important stuff. And that's really, really key. Uh, the other thing is I'd that, say... Is that talking that you were saying there, that's obviously coming from whoever's on the, on the hoop, so the, or the keeper, basically. So yeah? It's best if it comes from the person that's on the hoops because they can see the most of the pitch. Yeah. But everyone chatting. If I think I'm going to lose my matchup, yes, it's embarrassing to say it, but I've got to tell my teammates. If I think I've, I've got my player locked down, there's no chance of them scoring... If they get the ball, fantastic. My teammates can worry about hedging somewhere else. If I think they're going to shoot, and if anyone's ever watched me play, I think everyone's going to shoot as soon as they touch the ball. I'm going to say, they're shooting right, they're shooting left. I think they're going to pass right, I think they're going to pass left. Even if I say, they're going to shoot, and they don't, I've deterred the other person from thinking of shooting. Okay, because all that takes is a bit of a hand up. I've said, I, I think I've read you. I think I know what you're going to do. And I'm ready to stop that. I can read the game. That's really, really difficult to do. And especially against experienced players who will make it look like they're going to do something else so they can do something else. Uh, but it's really good to, to get in the, the habit of saying, they're going to shoot right, they're going to shoot left, they're going to pass. And you can do that with your teammates in training. You see them all the time. And those skills will transfer gradually. But everyone should be confident speaking and everyone should be loud and proud. Don't mutter it under your breath. Say it so everyone can hear. Okay, okay, when you're on, a good rule of thumb it, it on it, I would say, for communication is if you're saying something, you're just talking. It's not communicating until you hear a response. Um, so if hmm. I say danger going left, runner going left or whatever, or I'm being, I've lost my mark, I need someone to go okay got you because otherwise i'm just shouting into the wind like yeah um yeah it's something we got told very young at sports at like primary school it's not communication until you hear it but it's until it's two ways um because mm. otherwise i don't know if it's been heard or not especially if you're playing in like a bigger or more important match where you've got a lot of spectators and making a lot of noise or if your team might be hated and you might be being booed like whatever <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, do, I wouldn't know about that. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I think, sorry, just the, the point you were talking about about confidence as well is like, say if you were the person at the front, you can't actually see, sorry, the, uh, the <laughs> point chaser, right? You yeah. couldn't see yeah. your team. But if you can hear them talking, you've, you've got to get a bit of confidence going, they have got, they're sorted behind me. Like, yeah. even, like I'm obviously going to try and stop this person. But if I don't, I've got three people that know exactly what's going on. They've got everything covered. It's all locked down. I suppose that that must, as as small as it is, but I think massively, um, you can yeah, focus on your yeah, thing. Yeah, you need those small margins sometimes, don't you? Exactly. It's it's reassurance and it's trust. And this is especially if you're watching this as a new team. This is when your socials hanging out become important. I'm a lot more likely to trust you if I know who you are and you're my friend. Okay. The reason that I trust James isn't just by happenstance. It's because I've known him a long time, I've hung out with him a long time, and I've played over 100 games with him. Okay? Trust doesn't happen overnight. I say played, I've been, I've been at 100 games. You've been there. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, this is the time in training in games, that's when you build those connections. You start to know each other's strength, you start to know each other's weaknesses, and the more you know about that of your teammates, the easier the game becomes. And that is when hanging out, being friends, chatting to each other. If you think your friend's really good at something, you need to tell them. And in the same way, if you think they need to work on something and it's happening all the time, you've got to let them know. If I'm conceding every shot on the left hoop, I need either to notice myself or my friend to say, hey, Jay, um, every, every time they're shooting left, you're, you're letting it in. Why do you think that is? Okay? And even if I don't know the answer, I can try and ask someone who does. Um, and that's what's really important. It's not just communication on pitch, it's communication off pitch as well, okay? The closer you are off pitch, 
the closer you're going to be on pitch. And the more you trust each other on pitch, the much better time you're going to have when you're off it as well. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Right. So, got to summarise that there. So, uh, it's alright. We've looked over a combat defence. Uh, this is a zone defence where the players are all much tighter in towards their own hoops in order to encourage people to come towards them in terms, in terms of making sure that they are close enough to help their teammates uh, if they need help in making a stop and to reduce the amount of physical energy they're having to exert by running around all over the pitch. Uh, we've looked at the strengths of it. Strengths being, if you're a tackle-heavy uh, defence, um, you're encouraging people to run at you to go through your zone, to go through multiple people, that's going to win you the game there. You can keep your first line on for longer because they are not having to run around as much chasing after somebody. And you've also got the advantage of being able to help if there is a mismatch somewhere. Uh, weaknesses are there as well, obviously. Uh, there's always somebody free. There's someone who's not going to be marked, who has not got somebody necessarily going for them in their zone. There's a free zone pretty much all the time. You've got to mark the hoops. Fast ball speed can unlock this by moving the ball around really quickly. And if you don't trust your team and you start to hedge where you shouldn't, uh, the zone will start to break down. And we've just gone over how to drill it, put people into position, get them used to where they need to go and get everybody to play every role so they can learn it. And, you know, do some good team socials, bond, get to know each other, trust your teammates. Okay. Has anyone got anything that they would like to add to the wrap-up? No, yeah, good. just as a last point, you won't get this right the first training you do it. It won't be perfect from the off. As with all skills and all new things, perseverance is really key. You've got to have patience. It's going to take you a long time to do it right, especially the first time you try it. But... Trust us, you, you do need to stick with it. And if you, you see it out, it will definitely give you a good base to expand from uh, the first time you're starting to play. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I hope you found this informative. Uh, we're going to be putting uh, this up on social media as well as the PowerPoint with the explanatory notes so you can refer back to it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, next time. So thank you very much. And take care and stay safe. So, he says, Aha, editing. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>